Hi guys. Hi guys. Welcome to this week's episode. This one's going to be another boring chat. But it can't be too boring. Uh, the last chats that we had have been like times 20 our greatest viewers. So um, uh, this one again will be about the design of Jupiter and the building of Jupiter because well, a month ago we put out two videos the building of an aluminium performance cruising catamaran god that's hard to say <laughs> and the long. fitting out of an aluminium performance cruising catamaran <laughs> um, and we just had inundation uh, of inquiries uh, questions uh, and how to get in touch with the designer and builder um, so uh, he's been inundated and you know snowed under with correspondence uh, when he should be building boats and I have too when we should be making movies uh, <laughs> so we thought it'd just be simplest to put together a, a video answering the most common questions that, that were raised about uh, building and fitting out of Jupiter 2 So, um, we should start with a, a specifications, because even that is not clear. And why is that not clear? Because there's nothing online. Yeah. Um, let me, that's actually the first question. You read the first, she's got the job of reading. <laughs> so the number one question is, how come I can't find any info online or website? Yeah, so uh, the designer builder does not have a website. Uh, there's not anything formal about the design whether it's specs or drawings or anything there's nothing online um, so uh, and the reason for that is he doesn't need the business uh, he's a small uh, operator um, running a small yard uh, maybe they can put two or three boats out over a two-year period um, and that's he's happy with that so yeah no marketing, very little information out there. In fact, our channel is probably the best source of information about the boat. Uh, this video is going to help out. So, um, let's give you some of those specs that uh, everyone craves to know about. Um, so, I'm going to read a little bit off the computer because I can't remember everything. Uh, but basically, so we are 14.52 meter long, which is 48 foot aluminium performance cruising catamaran the waterline length is just a little bit smaller because we have the standard uh, uh, sheared bows I think that's the right word the beam of the boat 7.4 meters the hull waterline beam 1.176 meters the draft with rudders 0.72 meters with daggerboard down, 1.8 meters. Displacement, light ship, 6.1 tons or a thousand kilos, because I think tons are different in different countries. Anyway, 6,100 kilos, light ship. Uh, designed cruising displacement, 7.4 tons. And the maximum displacement for performance, 8.7 tons. Um, I think we're heavier than, than that. We got a lot of shit on this boat. Um, I'd easily be going nine and a half tons, and we still do pretty good, you know. Uh, bridge deck clearance, zero point eight eight five meters. Uh, so let's go back to the basic um, engines. We've used uh, Beta Marine engines, thirty-five horses each side. Um, but the designer normally uses Yanmars. I think it's because he gets a good price on them out of Australia. Uh, he normally uses the, the 29 or, or the 30 horsepower Yanmars. You can choose a higher uh, horsepower engine up to say 40 probably without changing too much but uh, it's just that extra weight um, and 
extra weight is a detriment to sailing performance so it's up to you uh, batteries we've gone lifepo we've got uh, lithium batteries 800 amp hours we've had them for six years now and they're still going strong in fact that might be a, a video one day soon mm -hmm. fuel uh, now all this is up to you you know this is not the designed it's up to you how much fuel you want to carry how many batteries you want to carry and how much water you want to carry but Jupiter we have about 480 liters of fuel uh, diesel tankage um, usually we don't fill it unless we find it cheap and then we you know uh, and that that would normally last the six months of normal cruising water we have nearly 800 liters of water we doubled the tankage um, when I was getting Jupiter built again that's personal preference uh, solar panels we have uh, nearly 1200 watts um, and we've done a video on that separately uh, that came out a few months ago I think that's about all we, we've got you know everything else is personal preference oh he mast the standard rig that uh, Tim normally buys is 18.5 meters and that's an air draft of the, off the water of about 21 meters uh, the boom 6.2 meters long sail areas the mainsail we got square top main at 78 square meters the headsail 49 square meters spinnaker is 150 square meters and the screecher is 90 square meters um, we've used uh, Anderson winches all around and that's about it for the specs so second question please my dear <laughs> second question is are they still making these boats yeah so well you can always buy the plans off Tim Mumby um, and have it made by anyone a custom designer but you know um, it's not going to be the same yes it's going to be the same structurally perhaps uh, but the finish that he does is pretty special uh, you know this sort of finish and, and he's perfected this technique with his boys. He did stop building uh, in the Philippines for uh, nearly two years, I think. But they are operating again now. As of April 2021, uh, the, he's got a manager over there or a partner who is supervising. They're building a boat right now. Um, and and Tim will get back over there. Tim and his wife will get back over there just as soon as this COVID restrictions are lifted. So yes, he is building again. Um, however, I think his list, you know, of uh, interested prospective builds is getting longer and longer. So um, you might want to get in quick. What's next? Next one is how long would it take to finish? Yeah. Okay. So. I may have confused, I think I've mentioned on the boat tour video that Jupiter took four years and now that's a special case. I didn't pay him enough money. I, I was going through uh, financial problems at the time and I could only just dribble feed him every few months. I, I would give him some more. Uh, that's why it took four years to build. Um, normally uh, without that uh, hindrance then it would take uh, normally around 20 months for a basic finish maybe a little longer if you wanted it fully painted like hulls painted because uh, it's a basic finish is not painted hull but uh, okay all right so number four is why did you why did yours take four years oh i just said yeah <laughs> finish <laughs> number five is what is the current price of this build Okay, so yeah, but the videos that I put out a month ago, I mentioned that I paid about three hundred thousand US for this complete. Um, after speaking with uh, Tim, I've uh, he's mentioned that the prices of everything have gone up. He has to pay, you know, taxes, and and the government is wanting uh, permits and the cost of all of that. So the prices have gone up. He's suggesting around four hundred thousand USD in 2021 so the next question is is the builder able to customize customization yeah so yes he is and but he's willing to entertain sea kindly ideas 
you know, he's put in years of work refining this design to make it better and better and better every time. And then uh, to have a customer come in and say, oh, I want it two feet higher, <laughs> you know, you're going to find problems um, if you want to change, you know, things like that. But things like galley up, galley down, um, he's happy to do what you want to do there. Um, you know, like uh, we have a nav station, you know, some, some mumbies don't have a nav station. We've got three cabins plus a laundry. Uh, a lot of the guys use them for charter, so they're four cabins with four toilets, even some of them, you know, like, so that sort of customization, yeah, no problem. Um, but just have a chat with him. Next question is, um, are there any other sites available? Yeah, I... Well, first of all, this one's a hundred mil bigger than his first ever Bumbies. But he since, so this is a 48 foot. He has since uh, told me he's been doing a 45 and he's also doing a 50. And he actually showed me a photo the other day of, um, he sent a photo of the 50 foot hulls and I'm going, oh, oh that's great. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I just go, oh, look at that. Oh. More bigger. Yeah, bigger, better. Yeah. And it wouldn't be much more. Like, like the price wouldn't feet. be much more at all. Yeah. Well, I think 55, you'd have to get new drawings done, you know? You'd have to, that and there's a lot of cost in that and getting, you know, structural analysis done for a, a much different boat. So, yeah, 45, 48's the standard, and 50. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's with that? wiring in the ceiling. Ah, see, okay, so on the fit out video I mentioned uh, the wiring runs and I uh, scared a lot of people by saying that there's wiring uh, in the ceiling behind the lining and the, the access is uh, nil. Um, so let me just uh, re-explain that those wire, it's just for the lights, just the overhead lights. Um, and they are within conduit and they are embedded in foam so they cannot move they cannot chafe very unlikely suddenly going to have a problem on a double insulated dual, dual, dual core wire uh, in the ceiling and even if you did you could remove it like take the light fitting out get to the ends tie on your new wire or stick, solder it or sticky tape it together and then from the this other side just pull that wire through I mean you can easily replace it um, but yeah if you're desperate for access to that wiring uh, for you know from the from the get-go then the option would be to have conduit running along your ceiling which is really ugly so there's really no drama about it at all uh, so the only wiring is the lights that's it in the in the behind the lining okay. no dramas yeah. next question is on your video it looks like jupiter is hobby horsing or jumping yeah okay so we, we were showing some footage when we were sailing with umadum they they shot this footage um and at one point jupiter's doing a bit of bouncing and people go oh it looks like it's hobby horsing that's no good um if you watch the video a bit longer, maybe we cut it wrong. <laughs> but if you watch it a few more seconds, you see it's only about two or three jumps. Um, and it was 20 knots blowing out there. And, and then it just smooths straight out and there is no change in speed. That's not hobby horsing. That's just jumping a couple of waves. Um, hobby horsing is where you're doing this and it knocks off half of your speed. Uh, that's undesirable, yes, but uh, no, this is not hobby horsing. Uh, being a lighter boat than the other boats of a si similar size, um, and much lighter. Well, I told you the weights earlier, but for a similar size, like say Lagoon, it's 30% um, lighter, for example. So it, it's it's going to be more active on on, an, on a seaway. It's going to be more active because going faster for a start you're going, <laughs> you're going at least 30% faster than a similar sized uh, boat 
a heavier cat is obviously going to wallow a lot and not move so much. Um, but that's the difference in performance. So yeah, not hobby horsing, just jumping a few waves, that's all. And we'll show you, we'll just smooth straight out, straight away. Okay. What's next? You're ready for mm -hmm. the next question. How fast does it go? Do you have a polar diagram? Yeah, so uh, obviously, you know, and everyone wants to know, oh, how fast does it go? Um, it's just so variable. Uh, and no, there's no polar diagram produced. I mean, people can make their own. Uh, there's probably some computer logging program that can do that. Um, polars only, they're very useful for getting some idea of the potential. In fact, I, I googled it and Wikipedia says uh, the potential speed of a vessel and um, words like that. So manufacturers, you know, grab a hold of that loophole. As long as you say potential and maybe, then we're safe, you know, and then they, they can exploit those brochures, you know, the speeds. And um, uh, when I've asked uh, the designer about this, he said, no, nah. he said, just go for a sail on one and you'll see. And the, the, the reason is, yeah, a polar only looks at wind angle and wind speed and the resulting theoretical speed the boat will do. But sea state is a huge factor in determining your your final speed. Um, and it's very hard to get the same sea states. You know, if you're testing various angles, you know, you, it's very hard to get the same sea states. So that's why there's no polar out there. But from experience and on a heavy boat, We've got our whole life on this boat and, and it weighs a bit. Uh, we can generally equal wind speed, apparent wind speed, uh, up to say nine knots. So let's, let's, so the fastest point of sail is, is a beam reach or just forward of a beam reach. Yeah? So let's call it a beam reach. If we have 10 knots of wind, we'll be sitting on eights and nines. If we have uh, 15 knots of wind, we'll be sitting on nines and tens. Uh, if we have 20 knots of wind on the beam, we'll be sitting on say 12s. Uh, and, and by then we're slowing the boat down. We, we don't, you know, and, and that again depends on sea state, but you don't, you know, 12 knots on a cruising boat is, is fast enough. Don't want to go any further. I mean, we're happy with tens. Really? <laughs> I know I'm always trying to get more. Um, but the beauty and the benefit of a performance cat is not how fast does it go, but the fact that you can keep sailing in light winds. Our uh, South Atlantic crossing uh, ended up being like <laughs> five and a half thousand miles. Yeah. And we barely saw more than 10 knots the whole way. Uh, so calm. Very light. Uh, and it was, it was all down, uh, usually, half quarter or right on the bum which is not much good for going any sort of speed but in five knots of apparent wind we were still able to do five knots speed over ground and that's what you want out of a performance cruising boat a performance racing boat's a whole different thing that's how fast can you go but a performance cruising boat is we get to keep sailing instead of starting the engines because on a five and a half thousand mile passage, starting engines is pretty useless. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Run out of fuel in about three days. So yeah. now we keep sailing. Mm -hmm. So that's the beauty. Okay. So next question: How do you, how do they make that fiberglass lining? Right. This stuff. So yeah, we even had people saying that's not aluminium; it's a fiberglass boat. <laughs> but this is fiberglass lined, and this is one of the beautiful. Uh, jobs that uh, Tim Mumby does um, they make this stuff from scratch uh, so it's I, I, I wasn't there and I've got no video of how they actually make it and plus it's probably his secret and he doesn't want me to tell anyone uh, but basically it consists of a glass table like a six by four foot glass table I guess they rub or, or, or put on some sort of wax or releasing compound 
and they uh, I think this is how they do it they paint on gel coat maybe two or three layers of gel coat just white so that's what you can see here um, and on top of that goes chop strand mat maybe I don't know two layers and then they'll trim off the edges peel it up and you have a nice big sheet of this and the roof is textured I guess they use like a a linoleum, a lino, or, or some textured surface instead of the glass uh, to get that nice pattern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there's a couple of mumby boats out there that have not been finished. The interior has not been finished, and um, actually, we got friends. It's not a mumby, but we got friends with an aluminium boat that's not finished inside. It's really daunting. To try and fit a boat out nicely <laughs> i'd hate to take on the job but i'm just so glad that they do such a great job in philippines okay all right so um, can i use electric motors yeah i don't know of any that have done it yet but i do know of at least a couple of builds uh, in the future where they're planning the use of electric motors uh, I don't know the configurations, and I don't. I guess they've got a generator somewhere as a backup, uh, and obviously lithiums and solars. But yes, Tim is discussing how they're going to do the electric motor thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. And then, so this is the last two questions. Uh -huh. Any electrical system requirements on Ali boat? Yeah, there. There's some electrical design considerations for aluminium um, all right, this is this is going to be a subject of a video because it's a big subject um, any any metal boat you have to think carefully about especially your 240 volt or your 100 volt depends on your AC uh, power you don't want uh, that coming into contact with your hull at all and uh, and you need precautions in case it does so that's that's one thing about metal boats aluminium you have to manage it carefully because aluminium on the galvanic scale aluminium is one of the lowest or least noble metals which means if you put two different metals in a electrolyte and and an electrolyte is a a medium which electrical current can flow like salt water um, one of those metals will be more noble and one will be less noble so what will happen is it's a battery is set up um, so electrons will be flowing a current will be flowing between those two metals uh, and aluminium is about the third weakest galvanic metal there's only magnesium and zinc which is the lowest so you have to be careful with your electrics with that um, you don't want your aluminium hull to become part of a battery then disintegrate so it's just about managing those risks and it's really quite doable um, one of the ways that you do that is to uh, ensure you don't have stray currents from your electrical system which could uh, cause your hull to be become part of an electrical circuit um, and you would wire the boat using floating earth or, or that's what you're striving for anyway a floating earth now what that means or a floating ground is another similar meaning term what that means is that you have your hull should not be part of the negative return to the battery like a car you can have a single wire going to a light bulb that light bulb holder is metal and it's attached to the chassis of the car and it returns to the earth uh, sorry to the battery negative via the chassis you don't do that with aluminium boats you have two cores positive going to the circuit negative coming back to the battery um, so that sounds simple enough but engines like ours are designed to have a negative return through the engine block the starter, the alternator, the negative is all the engine block. And of course the engine is attached to the hull of the boat in some way. You know, you've got the rubber engine mounts, 
but that's not a good enough insulator. You've got wiring harnesses running off. You've got um, yeah various ways that uh, the negative could return through the hull into the ocean and to return to Earth. So these things you've got to try to avoid. And uh, as I say, it's a long subject. Uh, it's even a contentious subject. People argue about which is the best way to go. Um, so we're going to save that for a whole another video. Because there is still argument about whether this floating Earth is necessary and the fact that it is actually quite difficult to achieve fully, um, is it worth the effort? Um, and speaking with various owners and the builder and, and, and his experience with aluminium boats, it's arguable. And it just depends on so many factors. It would depend on uh, your, your paint system, how well protected or in, encoded your uh, hulls are in the water. Do you have any scratches or dings where there's bare aluminium showing? Are you in a marina or sitting next to a steel boat or um, stray currents from, from those sources? Uh, do you have dangling bare positive wires in your bilge? you know, the condition of your, your wiring system. So, it's arguable. <laughs> if you've got the boat is in good nick, good condition, well maintained, um, and not floating earth, might be fine. And we've traveled for some time without floating earth because um, of the switch problems that I keep having. So, uh, these heavy duty switches, yeah, there's a whole video on those. Um, so, yeah, can argue about that in another video. Okay, how many more we got? We have last one. All right, <laughs> last one. And uh, the last question is, are you ready? <laughs> Bracing myself. Anything you would do differently when building this boat? Okay, yeah, it's a good question, and it's a question I would always ask too. Is there anything we would do differently if we were doing this build again? Um, only a couple of small things um, through hull fittings I haven't talked to Tim about this but uh, surely it, it is doable instead of using nylon or marilon through hull fittings uh, which are or, you know scare some people but you have to because you can't have a different metal in the water with your aluminium uh, although some people do with a plastic spacer but I'm not happy to do that in the bilge anyway is to have welded through hull fittings uh, aluminium pipe some thread on the end you can put your uh, seacock on top of that um, plastic nylon seacocks of course uh, or marilon which are a bit pricey so yeah I'd get that done the other thing uh, I would request for the bilges to be painted yeah. because um, it's always, a, especially from the water maker, always a couple of drips of salt water coming down into the bilge. It dries out, leaves a bloody salt farm in there sometimes, you know. So um, you always want to be flushing your bilges, like every at minimum every six months. Get the hose in here and give them a good wash and a, and a scrubbing brush, and wash them down uh, to remove all that salt buildup because that's you know any. The saltier the water is, the more conductive to electricity and possible corrosion problems. Um, so paint in the bilge first would have helped that. Uh, I've come across another alley boat who, and he said, yeah, your bilges aren't painted? And I went, no, <laughs> damn, should have done that. And I can still do that now. Yeah. It just takes the effort of cleaning them up really well and acid washing and um, painting. And we, we'll, we'll get around to that. Uh, the only other thing, is the inner force day? Inner force day. Uh, is always it's uh, we've used the storm jib we've used. Well, we used it all across the Indian, but um, rarely. In two years, we've used it like three times, I'd say. But we we're glad we got it. Uh, but it just makes it hard for the Genoa to tack. Um, we did talk about this uh, when I was building the boat, but we just I was so keen to get on the boat and just go. Could have built it, but just never got around to it. And that is a high field lever system on the 
inner force day. And it basically, it's just a big lever that you can exert some force and a hook. So you could put the force day, bottom end of the force day, uh, thimble. I don't know if you can see my very scientific <laughs> demonstration. Put it in the hook and then pull the lever across and it pulls tension down and now you have a tight four stay, inner four stay. And when you're not going to be using it, put the lever up the other way, releases the tension, you can grab that four stay, lash it against your mast or, or somewhere else um, so that it's all out of the way and your Genoa will tack nicely. So maybe that, I, I, we, we can still do that any time uh, and maybe we will. Can't think of anything else like uh, just little things like that. <laughs> All right, do we finish? Yeah. Woohoo! So I hope you guys uh, got something out of this. Um, it's a great design. I'm soon we're going to be putting out uh, some vids on the pros and cons of aluminium boats, and also a vid on the design features that make the Mumby design so good. All right, have a great week. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Oh, uh, yeah, because, you know, otherwise, yeah. Cheers. <laughs>